What's up, family? How are y'all? Hey, that was weak sauce. I think we can do better than that. I know it's late, but I think we can be a little bit more hype than that tonight. So let's try that. What's up, guys? How are y'all? That was a lot better. That was a lot better. I mean, well, hey, I'm Chris. Um, I really wish I was Matt Sane because he's a lot more attractive than me. Um, yet I'm not, so I'm Chris. So uh, that's all you got is me. Uh, but what I want to do this evening uh, is, is I would just love it if we could all just pray. Um, I, mean, I know that normally in this type of setting at church or whatever, what happens is that one person prays and everyone hears that the person pray and you kind of act like you're praying. Uh, but what I want to do is all of us to actually pray. So however that looks for you, I mean, if you want to talk out loud, if you want to just hold your hands out and just uh, quietly um, just ask him for something, I would just love it if we could all just pray and have a real, like, half a minute of just like, real prayer to the Lord. Because he's here. He's here right now. Uh, it's, it's obvious he's here right now with all the trees and the skies and just how incredible this is. Um, and I just really believe that he's going to do something real special in all of our lives, and I, including myself. So everyone that's here, uh, if you're all the way up at the clubhouse up there, or if you're, you know, hanging out in the truck up there, or if you're running sound, or if you're here, you know, everybody in this place, I would just love if we could just have half a minute of really talking to the Lord. And even if you're here and you're like, I don't believe in God, um, man, I would just ask you to pray and say, hey, if you're real, speak to me. Speak to me. So let's all pray real quick, and I'm going to pray after. So the topic uh, that I'm going to talk about this evening is what is worship? What is worship, right? Because we come to these things, right? I remember... Um, as a small, I was like 12 or so, and I got invited uh, to this huge Christian concert. It's called House Party. Um, all these huge names, and I came, and I wasn't a Christian at the time. I wasn't raised in the church. And everyone had their hands raised and, and was like praying out loud and ugly crying. And I was like, what in the world are all these weird people doing? That's real. That's how I was, I was like, man, what, what are these people doing? Like, you know, they're a whole bunch of old people and weird looking people. And like, I'm 12 years old and I didn't, I didn't understand like what was happening. I mean, if I'm honest, even as a Christian, right? And I'm a preacher, this is what I do. Even as a Christian, man, I have that same thought, right? You kind of hit this rhythm of I'm going to church I'm, and I'm, I'm praying, I'm hands raised, I, you know, hold them out here sometimes, and I do the, like all, all that stuff, but, but what is all this about? Right? Like, why do we sing? Why do we come together? Why do we worship? And I lose sight of that. So what I want to talk about this evening is what is worship? What is worship? I have a friend uh, who describes it like this. He says that it's, uh, it's easier to understand worth-ship. Worth-ship. Right? It's saying, hey, I ascribe worth and all of the value to one thing. That I have an object of my worship. What I'm saying is that thing is the most worthy thing in my life and the most highest treasure in my heart. Right? It's the thing that I wake up in the morning and it's in my mind. Right? It's, I hop out of bed and it's the first thing that's on my mind in the morning. And all... Um, as I'm working and I'm doing my, you know, um, eating food all day, it's on my mind, right? And as I head to bed at night, I lay my head on a pillow, I'm, I'm thinking, man, this is the last thing that's on my mind is the object that I worship, right? It's the thing that I spend all my time and energy and resources and money on. This is what I worship. It's the thing that I would hand over everything else in my life if I could just have this one thing. I mean, as I just kind of look over the course of my life, I realize that I have um, had that experience with a lot of different things all through the course of my life. Um, I remember 
as a kid, I loved sports, right? I loved playing basketball, right? And every morning I get up and the first thing that's on my mind is, I have to go get some hoops, right? I want to go play some basketball. Like that's all I want to do. And then all day long I'm in school. I'm like, man, I just can't wait to get home and play basketball. Like that's all I want to do. And then as I was heading to bed at night, that's the last thing that was on my mind was, man, I want those new Jordans. Man, I want to be on the basketball team at school. Uh, but then I tried out in seventh grade and got cut. And so it didn't work so well for me. Um, and then also got cut in eighth grade. So, I, so that wasn't a good uh, thing to worship. And it was like, hey, well, it's probably not sports. And I started, man, everything I did uh, was all about popularity. Right? I just, man, I just want to be popular. Right? In high school and middle school, that's kind of where I went. I was like, man, if I can just be popular, then I'll be great. So early in the morning as I got up, that was the first thing that was on my mind was how can I hang out with the cool kids today and, and, and man, have all the right clothes on and do that. And I worshipped popularity. And then after that, I was like, okay, well, I'm kind of a loser, so that doesn't really work. So I was like, man, uh, man, I just want to worship a girl, right? I just need a girlfriend. If I just have a girlfriend, then I'll be happy and I'll be, man, satisfied. And, and I centered my life around having a girlfriend, right? And I had one, and she wasn't really the one I wanted, so I jumped from girl to girl to girl trying to find the object of my affections and my worship. But ultimately didn't really work. So eventually was partying and alcohol and I centered my life all around how can I get more pleasure from partying, right? If I can just, man, hang out at this party and hang out with those people and have that amount of alcohol and all that patrol, like I'll, I'll, I'll be good. And I chased after that. I mean, after that it was weed, right? And, and, and everything in my life was aimed at weed. I spent all my time and my energy and my resources on having more weed. And the object of my worship was weed. And then eventually it was into harder and harder drugs. And, uh, and as a senior in high school, I tried heroin for the first time. And I was hooked, man. I made my life all about having heroin and more of it and I sold my life out to that thing and I worshipped it all my time and my energy and my money was spent on having more heroin I mean at the end of all of that right at the end of all that worshipping and saying no this is what I value most no that's what I value most no this is what I value most no it's this I jumped from thing to thing to thing and at the end of all that I realized that they didn't really work at all that I was still empty. I was still miserable. And it was almost like I had uh, just ran a whole bunch of miles, half a marathon or something, and came in and I had this ice cold drink of water that I was expecting and I took this big drink and there was one drop in there. I had one little drop on my tongue, but I was, man, I was real thirsty. So the thing that I've learned is I've just hung out with people and, and, you know, had a lot of conversations with all different walks of life, all ages, is that all of us are worshiping something. It's in our DNA, right? All of us were created to worship, right? Even as a kid, I remember, you know, uh, toys or friends. I would try to say, man, this is my favorite toy. This is my best friend. These, these are the things that I'm ascribing worth and value to, and these things are ultimate. All of us have that in our DNA, but the question I want to ask all of us here tonight is what are you worshiping? It's easy to say, okay, well, I'm a Christian, so I worship Jesus. I'm a Christian, you know, I worship God. Except if we look at our lives, Right? If we just check um, our time, our calendars, and our bank accounts, and, and our uh, space up here in our brains, what are we really worshiping with our lives? Because I could tell you all day that it's Jesus, right? I, I worship God, but in reality, sometimes I worship other things. I worship coffee 
in the morning a lot of times. Right? I worship uh, preaching. Right? I do. I spend a lot of time on on all of this. Right? I worship my marriage. Right? I I worship these things. So the question I want to ask us all tonight is what are you worshiping? And then on top of that, I want to ask you this, is it working? Is it working? Because what I've learned is is we were created to worship, yet if we worship the wrong thing, it's always going to return void. Right? It's always going to leave us in our soul like, man, that's it? That's it? That was, that was a cool experience. That was a cool festival, but, but, is, that, but is that it? And I remember as a kid on Christmas, I'd get up and I'd get all my presents and I'd open them all and had all the presents. Then at the end of it, I'd be like, is that it? There's got to be something else. So uh, what I want to lay before us this evening is I want to just put it out there, what we're supposed to be worshiping and how that looks and what are the implications of that on our life. So as you probably imagined and as you can probably expect, the thing that that all of us were created to worship was God. The thing that we're that all of us were like actually created to center our lives on was not sports, it was not money, it was not ministry, it's not even music, it's it's God. That's what we were created to center our lives on was God. Because here's the thing, every other thing will crumble under the weight of our worship. And a whole bunch of us have experienced that in relationships, right? We're like, if I just get that girl then I'll be so happy, and you get her, and then you're like, okay, well, she's not making me happy. Like, why aren't you making me happy? You're you're, you're not making me happy. No, are you leaving me? No, you can't leave me. And they will crumble under the weight of our worship because they can't handle it. Same thing with sports, right? We worship sports. We're like, I'm going to put all my eggs in that basket. I'm going to work so hard on that, and then we get older, right? And our knees wear out. It's like that. Okay, well, that's not it. Everything else crumbles under the weight of our worship, but here's the thing that doesn't. It's God. He will never crumble under the weight of our worship. He was what we were created to worship. Right? He, he's the author of all of this. He spoke this world into existence. He literally said, Earth. And here we are. Right? Every animal, he spoke it into existence, like the platypus, right? Who, who came up with that? That's a cool creature, right? He just spoke that. Cows, right? He just spoke that. Giraffes, right? That's a cr- He just spoke that into existence. Sunsets, right? He, he, just, he just makes it every night. It's a totally different one. There's, there's all kinds of different colors, and he speaks that into existence. How about love? Do you love anybody? Who do you think came up with that? <laughs> he is love, right? He, he spoke love. In, like he, that's, that's, what, he, that's his idea. How about coffee? Come on, I know I'm going to get some amens, right? We, we love, he, he can, he, that's his idea. The flavors and your tongue and how it hits the taste buds and hits your brain and how all that works together. Like that is God's idea. He, he's the creator of everything, but he also holds it all together. Right, if we just slow down and just all the planets and the stars and we just process like how everything is orbiting and, and, and how it's all like, like he, he's holding that all together right now. He's all powerful and he's all knowing. Right? He, he literally knows everything in the universe, every fact he came up with it all. And he's the author of joy and pleasure. Psalm 1611 is going to be on the screen over there. It says this, In his presence there's the fullness of joy. 
and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. The pleasure that our souls long for way down deep isn't found in pornography. Right? The pleasure that our souls long for way down deep isn't found in another relationship. Our pleasure that we, we seek so much isn't found in having a whole lot of money or having a lot of investments. The pleasure that we long for isn't found in another national title, Clemson fans, I'm sorry. I'm hoping for one, but... Right? The pleasure that we all long for can't be satisfied in any of those things. It's supposed to be found in God. And everything in this universe was created for His glory, right? You and I were created for His worth and His value, right? To just show this world that, man, He, he is infinitely valuable. He is worthy of everything. But as we all know, we've all kind of turned away from that, right? It's, it's uh, clear in Romans 1 that we have stopped uh, truly worshiping God and we've started worshiping his creation. We've turned away from the creator and we started worshiping his stuff. We center our lives not on him because that's how it was created, but sin came in and we started doing that with other things and relationships and jobs and success and all of that. Jeremiah 2, 12 and 13 says this, Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. One, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. What it's saying in that verse is that we have turned away from this uh, I mean, just flowing river of pleasure and life and joy in God and we've turned over here to one drop, one speck of water in pornography or in success or in a hundred other things. And we've looked at this life and this water and God and said, no, thank you. I'll take this. And it says that that appalls the heavens, right? That all the angels in heaven are like, what? Chris, you'd rather preach than, than just enjoy God? I have a friend who tells this story. Um, he's, um, it's an awesome story. His name's Ryan Yao. And he shared this story with me, but I'm going to tell it as if it's my own story. But I shared his name, so I gave him credit. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so I'm a traveling preacher. Right? I go around. I have to leave home a lot. I travel around the country. I'm on planes and stuff like that. And let's say that I had an early flight and I was going to go to California for two weeks. Um, I hopped up early one morning. Um, I kissed Kathleen on the forehead, who's my wife. Um, I went downstairs, it was like 3 o'clock in the morning, she was still sleeping, and I put roses um, on our table, right, in our living room, in our apartment. There's like 12, like, red roses, fresh cut, like, just beautiful roses. Um, I wrote her a note, um, I put them downstairs, and I uh, s sprayed the cologne I have on uh, the note, ultimately, to remind her of me, you know, as I'm going to be gone, right, which... That's a sweet move. If you're married, that, that's a good move. I'm just calling it out right there. I don't do that, but I need to, babe. Sorry. Uh, so let's say I have the roses and the card and all that, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to go, and I leave. Um, and I hop on the plane. Um, a few hours later, she wakes up, and she comes downstairs, and she is just like, man, my husband is a boss. <laughs> right? Like, he gave me up some flowers, a card. Like, this, this is what... I would, like, he, he's just awesome, right? I love my husband, right? And she smells the roses and reads the card and smells the card, and she's like, man, my husband is awesome, right? And every day, that's what she does. She comes downstairs, and she's reminded again, man, these are awesome. My husband's awesome. I love him. I can't wait till he gets back. And she reads the card and smells the roses. 
Um, a few weeks later, I'm, I'm coming home, right, and I can't wait. And I'm like, I can't wait to get home, have a home-cooked meal, hang out with wifey, and do married people things. It's going to be awesome, right? Like, that's, that's going to be awesome. To fling open the door, and I'm like, here I am. Like, where is she? And she looks at me, and she looks at the flowers and looks at me, looks at the card I had written her, looks at me, smells the card, and just starts hanging out with the flowers and the card and reading it and smelling them over and over again. All of us would say, that's stupid, right? Like your husband's home, like run to him, like that, that's it's a stupid thing to be just smelling the card. Like, that's weird. It's old anyways, now two weeks. I mean, those flowers are crusty, right? <laughs> All of us would say that, yet that's the same thing we do with God. Wow. He's given us such good gifts, right? He's given us such good gifts in, in friends and family and, and, you know, having a job, having a calling, I mean, having a marriage, having a relationship. Except the point of those gifts is to point us to the giver. We were made for the giver, not for the gifts. And we have turned away from him and we worship and we center our lives around his creation rather than the creator. And scripture says over and over again that there's consequences for this, right? Um, I wrote this down, I want to read to you. It says, it's evident throughout the Bible uh, that if people... uh, turn and worship anything other than God, despite how many religious rituals they participate in, his wrath is still on them. It's evident through the whole Bible that no matter how much you tithe, how much you serve, how much you, you know, plan and you preach, and you put on events, you play music, whatever you do, it, it is, it's evident that if you worship anything other than God, then his wrath is on you. Romans 6.23 says this, for the wage of sin is death. And that's not really popular even in church world. Uh, we love the good part, you know, the grace and all that, but we, but we hate that. But the greatest news in the universe is that there's a second part to that verse. The wage of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And man, that's what this whole thing is about. It's the whole reason why uh, the people who planned this and put this on spent lots of money uh, to have all these bands here to rent the campsite, to have all you guys here, to, you know, all the planning and the meetings and all that. It's all for that one truth. And here's the thing I want you to get. If you're here and you're a Christian, or if you're here and you're like, okay, well, I kind of act like I'm a Christian, but I'm not even in that world at all. He doesn't have my heart. I want you to get this. And this is the greatest news in the world is, yes, Our God is is real, right? And he did create everything for his glory, including us. Yes, all of us have turned away, and yes, his wrath is on us. Yet, the greatest news in the universe is he is not only a holy, just judge, he is also a loving father. And he loves you and I so much that he doesn't leave us condemned. He sent his son Jesus here to earth, who literally walked this planet He lived a perfect, sinless life in our place. He was crucified on a criminal's cross for our sins. And then he was put in a tomb, and on the third day, he didn't stay dead, right? He literally rose from the dead, conquering sin and death and everything. Right, and we do a great job in the church of teaching uh, the cross, right? Because on the cross, he paid for us turning away. He paid for every time that we center our lives around something other than him. Any time that we uh, center our lives around work or a relation, he, he literally paid for that sin. And that's what the cross did. 
Yet I'll be honest, I think we do a crummy job of teaching the resurrection. And the implications of the resurrection is, yes, we are forgiven of centering our lives around anything other than God. But in the resurrection, what he did is he gives us the power and freedom in order to center our lives around him now. That's the resurrection. Right? The cross, I'm forgiven. And the resurrection is I can center my life around God now. And that is the sweetest, most satisfying life I've ever experienced in my life. So this isn't all just something I've, I've heard about, right? Or something that I've um, you know, just kind of heard in a book or whatever. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scream it at you for you know, half an hour. Uh, this is all something I've experienced in my life as well. So, as I said earlier, I was, I was a heroin addict and a drug dealer, and um, I was an empty, uh, horrible person, to be really honest with you. Um, I, uh, I was just a mess. I was in and out of treatment centers trying to get sober, and I couldn't get sober. Um, I was 100 pounds, uh, and I had, you know, I was, I was hurting a lot of people. But on Christmas Eve, 2010, I was in a treatment center in Florence, South Carolina. Um, I'd only been there about a week. I was 100 pounds, so 65 pounds ago or so. Had a horrible speech impediment. I couldn't even tell you my name. Right on every word, I would stutter. But I was invited to a church service Christmas Eve 2010. And I went and I heard the gospel. I heard that there's a way that I can be forgiven, that there's a way that I can be saved, that there's a joy, man, that I can have access to. And I can be made brand new. I could be reconciled to God. Yeah. And that night I, I, I placed my faith in Jesus. I turned from my sin. I mean, I placed everything, everything I could in Jesus and, and, and who he was and what he did for me. And I'm telling you, from that point on, nothing has ever been the same. Amen. The emptiness yeah. that I once felt is now sweetly satisfied with the presence of God. Yeah. The speech impediment I once had that, it, man, ruled and consumed me. He's healed it almost all the way, and that little weakness I still have, he, he humbles me with it. One of the sweetest examples, I think, of what this really looks like. What is genuine worship, right? What does this look like? Is in Luke chapter 7. And we don't have time to kind of go there with um, the whole story. But ultimately what happens is Jesus gets invited to the Pharisee's house. Right? And if you know anything about the Pharisees, they're uh, hyper-spiritual, arrogant pricks, ultimately. <laughs> Real. Come on, preach. Uh, preach, white boy. Um, so he gets invited to their house, and he's eating, hanging out with them and stuff, right? And they're, they're eating, hanging out. Um, and this uh, sinful lady, um, I don't know exactly what that means, maybe a stripper, maybe a prostitute, uh, heard that he was going to be in there and snuck in the Pharisee's house. I don't know how she got in, but she snuck in the Pharisee's house um, somehow and came up to Jesus and started ugly crying at the feet of Jesus. She just starts crying her eyes out, pouring uh, tears on his feet and kind of rubbing her hair in the feet of Jesus and starts just smooching his feet all over. And then has uh, this expensive ointment that she has and starts pouring it all over the feet of Jesus and starts just crying and weeping and just truly worshiping who Jesus is. And obviously the hyper-spiritual, arrogant idiots, uh, the Pharisees, um, start criticizing her. It's like, man, if, if, if he was really a prophet, right, if he was really the Messiah that he's claiming he is, he wouldn't let her, like, touch him like that and kiss his feet and, and, and cry and do all that. Like, he would clearly tell her to leave and get off of him. And then he tells the story uh, to the Pharisees, he says, all right, uh, I'm going to tell you a story. There was this man uh, who, who um, uh, loaned people money 
all the time. He loaned this one guy 50 denarii, I think is what it says, or however you say that word, and another guy 500. I mean, he realized that the one who owed 50 and the one who owed 500, uh, you know, didn't have the money to repay him. So he forgave each of their debts. And he said, who do you think loves him more? And all the Pharisees said, well, it's probably the one who had the larger debt. And he said, you're right. And he said, that's exactly the situation that we're in right now, is this lady who understands that she's done so much wrong, is pouring out her tears and, and, and her kisses and her expensive ointment on my feet, ultimately handing me everything because she knows that she has a lot of sins and she's been forgiven much. But you guys who don't, you know, who don't really think that you have a lot of sin or a lot of debt aren't even loving me at all, right? You're just kind of, you know, having me over for dinner but not ugly crying at my feet. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Come on. So here's my question for us this evening. Is which person more accurately, accurately describes your life? Right? Are you the sinful woman who's ugly crying at the feet of Jesus, pouring out your life, pouring out everything at his feet because you know how much he's forgiven you? Or are you, you a lot more like the Pharisees? who are real dignified, who play it safe, you hang out with Jesus, right? But you're more proper. And you got it all together and you don't really think he's forgiven you of much. And I think when we start out in our Christian walk that we're more like the sinful woman. I was. I'm just, I'm just, I just, I mean, I can't wait to hang with Jesus, right? I just, I'm, I'm so in awe that I'm forgiven and I'm so grateful that I'm literally pouring my life out of his feet. But I think as we uh, hang out with church people more and we hang out at churches more, uh, that we turn more into the Pharisee. Uh, do we, we like Jesus, but we aren't pouring out everything at his feet anymore. And what I've learned and what scripture says is that the only right response to the gospel is to pour out everything at his feet our time and our energy and our money and our talents and literally everything to pour it at the feet of Jesus right? because we know how worthy and how valuable he is. So what I want to do is I want to give us three quick practical ways um, that all this is able to play out in our lives. How can we live a life of true, uh, like truly worshiping Jesus and it's these three ways the first one is this is that we make it our life's purpose to get as much joy in God as possible that our life is centered around the fact that he is of ultimate value that in his presence there is fullness of joy at his right hand are pleasures forevermore and we are going to sell our lives out to get more of him every single day. So that changes how we read our Bible. Right? It's not just, I'm a Christian, so I, this is probably what I should do in the morning, or I'm in ministry school, so i got to read this sucker, and I'm just going to read and, and, and pray because I have to, and I'm going to check my box. I mean, that turns this into, I just want to taste God. I just want more of Him. I just want more joy in God. It changes how we worship. It changes how we go to church, right? It's no longer, all right, I got to go to church because I'm a Christian and I'm on staff and I got to do this thing. It changed it into, man, I, I, I get to experience God today. And I'm going to center my life around trying to get more of him every single day. So I just want to ask us, how can you do that? What is one step you can take in order to just plan your life around having more 
joy in God. Practical way number two is this, is that we cut everything out of our lives that is hindering us from experiencing more of God. Right? And when I was all involved with uh, sports and really like selling my life out to sports, I cut everything out of my life in order to have more of that. I'm like, unhealthy food? Nope. I want sports. Right? Hanging out with friends? Mm, nope. Only for playing basketball. Because I want basketball. Right? And I sold my life out to that. Um, and as I was chasing heroin, it was the same thing. Right? Any friends who weren't doing it? I'm through with you. Right? Any, any uh, you know, Having a job that I didn't make a lot of money in, psh, I don't need that anymore because I'm selling my life out to heroin. All these other drugs, I don't, I don't want them. I just want heroin. I literally cut my li- everything out of my life in order to have more drugs. And the essence of worship is that we do that. Is that anything that's in our life that's hindering us from the object of our worship, and we cut it out. Matthew... <laughs> 1344 says this the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field in which a man found and covered up and then in his joy he goes and sells everything that he has in order to have that field so the question I have here this evening and the Holy Spirit is going to speak to us in totally different ways but what is in your life right now that's hindering you from experiencing more of God How can you cut it out of your life tonight? That's point number two. And lastly, number three. Is that we share him with as many people as possible. Right? It's in our human nature that we share everything we enjoy. Right? If I have a good cup of coffee, I'm telling everybody about it. I'm like, you got to go to this place, and it's, it's man, it has all of these hints and notes and, and flavors and all that stuff if you're into that. And I, I tell everybody, right, if I eat awesome uh, food somewhere or have a good slice of pizza, I'm telling everybody. I'm like, you got to go to this place and have this food because it's so good, and y'all should have it. Right, or if I... Uh, see a good movie, right? I'm telling everybody. If I watch a good TV show like The Office, which I'm, I know it's old, but I'm going to watch it till the day I die, right? I'm telling everybody, right? Even on stage at a Christian event, I'm telling you, right? You got to go see this. You have to watch this more, right? And that's how we are as humans, right? That, That is what we do. We share what we enjoy. So here's my question. How can you share Jesus more? Right, I'm not talking about corporate ministry because I've just seen in my life that the more I get paid for something, the less I really care about it. But um, how are you really pouring your life out outside of corporate ministry in order to share? Man, man just share them with people, homeless people on the side of the road, and just random coworkers, friends, family, whatever it is. How can we share him with more people? I mean, what is worship? And it is ascribing ultimate worth and value to something or someone. It's saying, this is the most worthy. This is my greatest treasure. This is uppermost in my affections. This is the thing that I want more than anything. And I'm willing to sell everything in order to have that thing. This is what I'm worshiping. And we were created to worship God. And he is the only one that can stand the weight of our worship. If we worship anything else, it will crumble under the weight of that worship. So I just want to plead with us tonight. I just want to plead with you personally tonight. And let's worship God. Like with our lives. Like not just hand raised and empty heart or whatever but I'm saying like in spirit and in truth let's worship the king of kings the lord of lords the god of the universe Jesus Christ that's who we, we were created 
to worship. And when our life is centered around him, and that's where we experience that fullness of life that he was talking about. And the abundant life that he freely offers to us. Because here's the thing, man, if we would do that, right, if only the hundred or so people here would say, hey, yep, that's me. I'm in. I'm in. I'm, I'm selling everything and I want Christ. Man, I don't want to just play the game. I'm in. But I, I'm, I'm going to worship him with everything that's in my life. If just this small group of people here would do that, the whole world would be changed. The whole world would be changed. Paul on a Damascus Road, right? He ha has this encounter with, with Christ. Scales fall off his eyes. He sees Jesus for who he really is. One person. And he goes on to change the world. Is that you? Is that you? What I want you to do is I just want you to take time to close your eyes and bow your heads and just evaluate your life. And just really think in your heart of hearts, hey, am I worshiping God? Or and am I playing a game and worshiping something else? So let's just, let's just have a time where our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, and I'll give an invitation here in a second. And man, this whole thing was for you. This whole thing was because the God of the universe loves you and has you here at this festival in order to hear about him and it may be only one person that's only you. If that's you tonight, I just want to tell you that how you're saved is you just place your faith in him. You understand that, man, I'm a sinner, I'm separated from God and, and I know I can't save myself, but I know that Jesus can. And I'm placing my faith in his work, in what he did. I know I can't earn it, but I'm going to place my faith in him. And if that's you tonight, I'm just going to lead you in a prayer. It isn't the prayer that saves you, y'all, but it's the faith that's behind the prayer that saves you. And how that looks is you're literally turning away from you know, trying to save yourself in religion and turning away from sin and turning away from the world and placing your faith in him. You can just pray this if that's you. He's listening. He loves you. He's closer than your closest thoughts. You can pray this to him. Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner and I know I can't save myself. But I know that you can save me. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the dead. I give you my life. I repent of my sin. Please will you save me, Jesus. If that's you tonight, I just want us all to keep our heads down and our eyes closed. If that's you, I just want you to throw your hand up in there and say, hey, listen, I just nailed it down. I placed my faith in Jesus. And I can't see you. I don't think anyone can see you, but you can just throw your hand straight up anywhere you are, up in the trees or in the food truck or wherever you are. I just want you to throw your hand straight up in the air and acknowledge, hey, I need Jesus. I just placed my faith in him. And if you did that, then you can put your hand down. But have a conversation with anybody here tonight. Um, almost everybody here is in ministry, so you can just have a conversation with somebody and say, hey, I just I prayed with Chris. I don't know what to do now. Uh, with all heads down and all eyes closed, still, if you're here um, and, and you know you have a next step to take, you know, whether it's starting to do something to have closeness with God, 
with Jesus or cutting something out of your life that you know is hindering you from experiencing him, uh, then I just want you to understand that the cross is sufficient for you. Like the sacrifice, what Jesus did on the cross is not a one-time thing that saves you and then is irrelevant. It is the thing that keeps us going. And his sacrifice, his blood on the cross paid for our sin and it is sufficient. How he rose from the dead, he empowers us to change. So I'm going to pray for us one more time. Have a conversation if that's you with somebody around you. And I'm going to pray for us one more time then hand it back over to the band. And God, I pray that you would do what only you can do. And that's change hearts in such a way where we see you for who you are and when we see you for who you who you really are god we can't help but give you everything you would take all the words uh, that i just preached and all the music that we've heard all weekend and that this festival and what you've done here god will go back and change our families and our schools and our churches and ultimately the world that we would all live lives that have you central. Jesus, we love you. We ask all this in your name. Amen.